Delighted to say we have a very, very special guest in the studio. Busy time of year for him, Mr. A.P. McCoy. A.P., thanks for making the time. I know it's a Pleasure. bit manic at the moment and the, the build-up to uh, Cheltenham. You're getting pulled here, there and everywhere. How have you been? Good, good. Could be worse, Keith. Could be working for a living. <laughs> Something that you and I will never know anything <laughs> exactly, about. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So what have you been doing with yourself? Bit of punditry? Um, yeah, a bit, bit of punditry. I do a bit of um, stuff on ITV Racing um, for the bigger days, working yeah. four days at Cheltenham. Um, for those yeah I'm keeping busy the golf is, is a little quiet at this time of the year I'm, I'm probably more of a fair weather golfer today, but I believe, but supposed to be playing at the K Club today but the weather I was quite pleased about that because I <laughs> something I never did when I was riding I ended up out in places in Dublin last night that I probably shouldn't have been but um, <laughs> you wouldn't have called it a very professional if I was uh, if I was still a jockey but you were out with a mutual friend of ours but we, 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 which will remain no, nameless we won't, we won't, no, we won't no, stitch no, him up no, but I was, I was supposed to be there but I was too busy preparing for him um, Good night to you this morning. Very, still have an air of professionalism about me. That's very professional, and you didn't miss a lot. We were very quiet. We was went it? home quite early. Yeah, quiet one. Quite early in the morning. Listen, um, I, I want to. You've, so you've 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 been relatively enjoying the the break, or is it still not quite um, sitting well? Have I been enjoying the break? I, I know I got to. I was very lucky as a jockey because a very dangerous um, sport to be in. I was able to walk away um, on my terms. You know, was I ready for it? You know, had I had enough racing? Probably not really, not really. But it was the right, you know, it was the right thing to do. I was nearly forty-one when I retired, which was a good age for a jump jockey. I'd been lucky enough to be champion jockey for twenty years, and um, I don't think there would ever been a right time. I often look; it is a dangerous sport, and I've seen colleagues being fatally injured and suffer severe paralysis and different injuries that. Um, you know that make me think how lucky I was to walk away. But at the same time, I used to think some. I wished I would get. I wished I got frightened by it. Sometimes I wished it. Did it never frighten you? Not really. You know, not not really. I, I just I knew the dangers of it. I knew there was two ambulances coming behind me. I knew I was going to end up in them at some point. But the, you know, in some ways, I kind of I miss winning morning else. But in some ways, I miss that the the danger. I miss the adrenaline of the danger. I miss. The riding in a twenty odd runner race at the Cheltenham Festival and maybe falling in the first three or four and you know sixteen or eighteen or twenty horses galloping over the top of you and you actually get up off the ground thinking God I got away with that yeah you know and it's mad to and then sometimes when you're on the ground and you don't get away with it you think well you know what I ride between seven hundred and a thousand horses every year you ain't going to get away with it all yeah. the time you're a bit unlucky yeah but as I said I'm well aware that some of my colleagues weren't lucky enough to get yeah. away with it and. There's days in the wear room as a jockey that I'll never forget because of that, you know. And it is, you know, it can be life changing for you, your colleagues, and for your families as well. So, but it was a great way of life, a great sport. Was that always the way you wanted to go, right from a small lad growing up in Ange? Was it always purely horse racing? Yeah, look, was it purely horse racing? My younger brother was All Ireland champion boxer, you know, he, you know, I suppose that kind of came from you know I think as in the north you came up you, you grew up as you watched the likes of Alex Higgins you played snooker you, you boxed because of Barry McGregor like yeah. you know you had you know icons I, I remember going and getting a, a football signed um, when I was eight in, a, in my local town where I felt by Pat Jennings you know because he was the Arsenal mm. goalkeeper and they just come back from the World Cup you know um you know, Lane Brady was someone that one of your heroes. Yeah, you know, and someone I'm actually friendly with now, and have played golf. You know, so with quite a bit. So that's you know, there's a lot of things. But was it always horses? And yeah, I think from about the age of eight or nine. Even though I'm not from a horse, my dad was a, a joiner, a builder, and you know, my mum we had a shop at home. You know, we had a four sisters, one brother. None of them have ever sat on a horse. But there's a picture of a, me and a horse when I was two. You know, so I think it was kind of, it was meant Something to be. There. And I left, I left home when I was fifteen. Keith, you know, I, I, I kind of left school a lot earlier than I should have done. I used to, you know, I, I pretty much didn't go to school my last year, in my fifth year of secondary school. I decided at end of September I went for about the month of September and then yeah. decided I didn't need to go anymore. But I used to cycle fifteen miles every morning to the late Billy Rock's yard to ride a horse, and I used to cycle fifteen miles back from the age of thirteen. Mm -hmm. You know. So that that was it was from then it was serious that yeah, wasn't it, it was, serious, it was yeah. proper and I knew like I left home when I was fifteen and obviously I left home thinking that if I'm any good at this I won't ever 
lived back at home and I didn't want people to think that oh he's back home he yeah. went for six you months didn't want to be a failure back. I didn't want to I left the exact same age as you 15 yeah. and similar similar ages in terms of going over to England and that would have been one of the biggest things that I didn't want because I would see footballers go over and come back and come back yeah. and the one thing that grated on me at the time was they used to have these parties and going away parties yeah. going away parties for what you haven't achieved you haven't gone anything. anywhere yet. Yeah. yeah and that would have been the biggest the fear of failure yeah. in terms of giving up not quite making it that not embarrassing I suppose but yeah. not wanting to come back with your tail between your legs I yeah suppose. pretty much I, I was like that and you know you do make those sacrifices my younger sister was barely even five so I didn't really get to see her growing up mm. um, but I didn't want to come back with my tail between my legs I didn't want to be a failure you know but I I you know I was quite an ambitious person and I I was going to try and give it my best and if it didn't work like there was nights when I left home when I was 15 I cried with homesickness and I thought I want I do want to go home I was in my room mm. and you think God I, I'm not sure I'm strong enough that, but I, I'm such a stubborn person I thought you know what I'm going to stick with it and I really really wanted to be a jockey you mm. know and that was and I and you know you kind of want to be you, you want to be successful as well you want to set yourself goals and my career didn't really start I wasn't an overnight success by any means I was I worked in Jim Bulger's for four and a half years and you know I thought I was capable and all that but I only rode nine winners in the four and a half years that I was there you know which is, is not you know it's it would be enough to make someone give up and I didn't at that time when I was leaving gyms I kind of didn't particularly like my time there but I know that it made me I know that he was so it was good grounding good great grounding you know great grounding and I was glad that I stuck it out for those four and a half years because when I did get the opportunity I had the grounding to cope with I had you know I, I you know I had, I had the experience um, of you know I wasn't you know, I wasn't someone that was just walking in and being a success so after six months yeah. you know it, it, I, I, it made me appreciate it even more it made me work harder for it mm. Uh, because I was getting this opportunity and I was getting it a little bit later you know so um, but I think in life I think you'd, I've been very lucky that I worked for very successful people and I've liked the people that I've worked for as well you know that's I been important to you hasn't it all the way a, through that's a big thing you I mentioned think, Jim anyway. Bolger obviously yeah. Maren Pipe yeah. all, JP after that yeah all all high achievers you know with high expectations you know they expect the best from you they expect the best from themselves and they expect the best from you yeah you know you're not just going to be tagging along behind them you have to go with it and work with it and and um and if you've got ambition they will make you better yeah. well, we were just chatting off and we'll get on to a bit of football chat later but we mentioned about you maybe not being a team you would have struggled in a team environment and Certainly in certain teams these days, like definitely in my oh team, God. Arsenal at the moment, I definitely <laughs> struggle. But, but with that, that's interesting mm. to see that that the people that you worked with in terms of JP, mm. you know, they have to have the same ambition. Oh yeah. In terms of where you wanted to go to, because you were so driven. You, you've already said you're so stubborn in terms of the way you want to go about it. You know, I often say that those people, those people who are ambitious, like they. they uh, they're never really satisfied. They all, you know, their ambition is never satisfied. They always want a little bit more. They're looking for that perfection that is never going to be there, you know. And and that's what those people that I worked for are, are like that, you know. And, so and when then, were you like that from? Them? I, I suppose you know I when it, well I, I often think now for people who went to Jim Bulger's if you had ambition to learn you would learn because things were done correctly right. you know he told you how you know that how he wanted things done and you either listened or he kept telling you and the quicker you listened the, quicker the less, you, you, the less you needed to be told yeah um, did you always agree with it at the time not really no no you know I was you know I def definitely didn't agree with it he was like a bit of a schoolmaster yeah. and you know um, but I do look back now and and he has ingrained things in me that I know we're, we're so correct in the way if I was doing it now I'd want it done yeah. as well and it was the same with with Martin Piper with or with JP you know they, they set standards and they, they they have expectations and you know they're very ambitious you know and they they, they want to be better and quicker and faster than everyone else you know yeah. they want to they want to try and get that edge that makes them different than, than how do the, they differ the how do Martin and JP differ um how do they differ? You know, Martin Pipe, Martin Pipe, for those that don't know, was the most successful jump trainer of racehorses there ever was. Um, his dad was a bootmaker, never had any dealings with racehorses at all, went racing one day with his dad, decided, wanted to back a horse and decided that none of them looked fit enough. 
came back and told his dad that he was going to train a racehorse because, you know, because that was what he was going to do. And his dad says, you know nothing about racehorses. And he decided that he was going to be a racehorse trainer to prove a point to his dad. And he read up books about athletes, whether it be Zebatek or whoever it was that, you know, who was the the Olympic athlete who won at different yeah. distances and how he integrally trained himself and, you know, and it was a, to prove a point to his dad who was a very successful man mm. because he told, his dad told him he couldn't do it. You know, obviously... Well, stubbornness got, again. Stubbornness yeah. again. Obviously he got the enjoyment from, you know, from being successful and wanted to be more successful. And then... But the more you want, the more the... I often say it, the more the, the need becomes a greed and, and you want everything, you yeah. know, and that... You know, I often hear about... I don't. Everyone's different. But I, I hear, I see young people get asked in questions now. But what is your goals? Oh, I don't really have any goals. I just want to enjoy it and all that. You know what I mean? You should always have goals. You know, because the goals keep moving. You know, they never. You get them, and then, the go, you know, you can never. If you don't have goals, you can never score. You know what I mean? You need to. You know, you need to have that goal. You need to have that target, and you need to be never satisfied with that target. You've, you, like, considering you were champion jockey, twenty times. Mm. I, I've, I read this recently where about you where you were never you never particularly enjoyed it you, you've, you've said you got to the last you tried to win it as soon as you could because you've enjoyed yeah. those few weeks because then that last race it's back yeah. to square one and I suppose it's a good trait because it, it kept you going Yeah. but was there any more room that you, or would you change that and I suppose look, the look. best the best players would, would go up time again we see we say for instance with Chelsea Man said they can't replicate it the next season because maybe players managers are resting on their laurels a little bit that's, that certainly wasn't the case with you yeah I, I often say that I, I, I've said numerous times that I don't know if I was ever content and I've said using the analogy that I didn't really enjoy it but I, I, I must have enjoyed it because it's what drove me mm. and what, what I did enjoy was that little fraction of time where I won and I beat everyone else but when I went out in the next race it was gone mm. and I was looking for that repetitive drug every time I went out and I couldn't get it every time I went out and that's where it was difficult to satisfy but I, I was I content you know I, I don't think I was ever satisfied but I, I did enjoy it I think I you know and for those 20 years you know when I I used to try the jockey's championship was was all year round it's it's numerical and the only real enjoyment or relief that I got was the time and it was numerically possible but no one else could beat me so if I was 50 winners ahead with or 40 winners ahead with a month to go or three weeks to go there wasn't enough races really for someone to beat me yeah. and I could enjoy it for that month but the day that I held up the jockey's championship trophy in Sandown at the end of the season that was it. It was gone. It was gone the day as soon as I picked up the trophy. In fact, the day I went to the races, I I went with this feeling inside me that Do you know what, I'm actually not champion jockey any longer because tomorrow it's back to normal. What was it? You just didn't want to give that up. You, so you yeah, didn't want I, anyone else in it to I, get ahead. I didn't want to give that up, and you know what, I liked the enjoyment of beating everyone. Did you? And and <laughs> a lot sadistic. of a lot of a lot of sports people will never admit to it, and it's one of the things you miss now. You miss you miss the ego of beating everyone you miss the adulation of beating everyone you miss you know going to the Cheltenham Festival and winning the Gold Cup in front of 70,000 people and people thinking you know what he's alright at what he does mm. you know um, but it my biggest problem throughout my career was not so much keeping the people I worked with or the people I worked for happy was keeping me happy yeah you know that's uh, you, you know you have to have, you have to have standards and you have to have goals and and can you, as a sports person, can you ever be satisfied? Yeah, you can be satisfied for a period of time. But, you know, I, I don't think that I was ever really, really satisfied. I do, look, I have, I'm have. i lucky that I'm retired now that I don't have any regrets. I know I didn't take any shortcuts. I know I went racing days when I was in total it's agony from, like, injuries and I'd keep going and... You know, so I know I didn't take any shortcuts. Yeah, if I was doing it again, I'd be much better. You know, as I've said it a few times, most of my colleagues said when I retired, you know, people said, oh, he's the winning most jockey of all time. He's ridden 4,357 winners. And one of them piped up and said, yeah, but no one's mentioned the 14,000 losers that he's ridden. <laughs> you know, so, you know, so you're the, uh, you know, so I'm the, I got reminded quite quickly that I was the losing most jockey of all time. Yeah. You know, but, but, you know, do I have regrets? No. And I'm not sure... You know, and I know that <clears throat> I know there was a few different footballers that, that I'd play with, but I listened to Jimmy and Janice on the TV last week, and he said about, you know, he regrets that he didn't feel like he didn't fulfil his potential, you know, and 
and and a few of his ex teammates had a little bit of a go saying sorry we didn't try a bit harder no, but I think he was having a go at himself rather than them you know mm. maybe it, was, it wasn't taken like that by that no it wasn't taken a lot by that but look I, I, I was looking at him and I thought fair play to you you know mm. you know, if he thought he should have done better it's a good thing to have Yeah. you know why shouldn't you think you should? yeah. I think I should have done better you talk, know, but t- talk to me about the sacrifice and you made one going to England at 15 yeah. I always say about about more so with footballers I would say it's, it's because of the life that you can have it's not so much a sacrifice for me it's choices but yeah. I think one big sacrifice that you certainly made and I've seen that first hand was your diet I don't yeah. think I could have done that. I really don't. Yeah, like I'm five foot ten and like not someone I'm proud of. Now the day I retired, I was ten stone two. I weighed myself during Royal Ascot this year and I was twelve eight. <laughs> um, I'm a little bit better shape now than I was. I, I think I got through that stage in my life where I just let it go a little too much. I think you're entitled to that. But I have a little bit more discipline now. But there would be days, you know, you'd eat once a day. Certainly going to the Cheltenham Festival and I had plenty of rides. I wouldn't have been eating. I wouldn't have had breakfast or like that. I never had breakfast. Obviously, I didn't have lunch because I was riding. Mm. And then I'd probably eat a little bit after after racing, you know. So there was days that you, you didn't eat a lot. There was sacrifices. You travel a lot. Um, but the reality of it is it didn't work. You know, I, I never done a day's work in my life. I genuinely mean that. Yeah, I was traveling up and down the length and breadth of England every day from the end of October until Christmas Eve and then you know from you'd have you'd have Christmas Day and Stephen's Day off and then you'd be back till the end the end of May if you didn't get injured so you really feel like it wasn't it wasn't work it wasn't it was never work people really? people there's there's lads out there working building sites that are working you know that are getting in a van mm. and going off to work that's work and and I'm not having to go at your profession or whatever I, but I I, I agree with what you've got but, to say I but I, I I read that you know that you know, I listened to TV or a radio station and said, oh, but, you know, he's had three games this week and, you know, he knew. I said, three games? You know what I mean? <laughs> he's doing something that any kid on the, the any kid in the street would yeah. give their left hand for. It's not work. Yeah. It's not the real world. And if they think, if any sports person thinks it's the real world, it ain't. Mm. You know, and the sooner people realise that and the sooner they appreciate the fact that, you know what, I'm in a very privileged position. I get to entertain people. I get to live my life because they're paying to come and watch me. You know, and the more sports people need to, I think, uh, me personally, I think the more sports people need to appreciate the people mm. that... that but you do get cocooned in a, in a bubble, don't you? Ah, I don't look, know you how need much to. it is with, with horse racing. Yeah. Certainly in a football environment, you have no idea. And that, yeah, I've retired similar time to yeah. you three, three years ago, and around three years ago. Football now has gone on to another level. Yeah. They, can't really relate. No, they can't. The man they, on the street. No, they can't. And 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 look, the TV and television rights have have obviously um, had a huge impact in that. But I, I agree with you. They can't relate to. But at the same time, um, you know, I I do think that they look. I I was the worst because I went to the Chatham Festival. I went into Wareham two hours before racing, and I was so selfish, so self centred. I wouldn't have known if the Pope was mm, out watching in. side I wouldn't I wouldn't have noticed you know and that's because you become engrossed you become ingrained in what in you and and in sport I think you have to but there comes a time I think when you you know when you have to give that little moment look I, I appreciate that you know that with the social medias of the world that now that people they can't really have a life they can't really have to be a bit cautious they have to be a little bit cautious but, but this is a very short period of time in their life and there'll come a time when they'll be like you and me when no one will care what they're doing and they'll be they'll just be another person that played mm-hmm. football or rode horses that someone else will be in the position playing for Manchester City or playing for Arsenal or Liverpool or Manchester United mm-hmm. you know or Chelsea they'll be taking the position people want to, the young lads of yeah. today will want to talk about him you know you know you look at the sporting icons of people that played football for Ireland the Paul McGraths of this world or whatever you know, or the the great horrors, the great footballers. You know, that someone else will come along. Yeah, they'll come we'll along. Take that place. We'll take that place. Yeah. You speak about when when you're not in that limelight directly. When did you start thinking about retirement? Did you think about it in the build up two, three years, a year before? I remember being in your house on Valentine's mm-hmm. night, 2015. Was about a couple of months before you announced your retirement. And yeah. You were kind of alluding to it that night. You yeah. were recording. Yeah, uh, being AP at the time. That's right. Um, and you were touching on it, but if I think about it myself, yeah, I was preparing for retirement for years. So, yeah. in terms of, and maybe that made me take 
my eye off football yeah. a little bit maybe I think yeah. and been not as driven but I was I was always wary of that day I retire I need something to do mm-hmm. like the, the thing about um, when did I think about retiring when I'd won 15 jockey championships I was nearly 36 and I set myself this goal to win five more jockey championships now there was a lot of reasons you know you know, a friend of mine who was a football agent, he was the one that talked me into doing the documentary Being AP. And, you know, he kind of sold it to me that, you know, that, look, my little boy Archie was barely even one. He said, he's not going to remember you riding and you sure you can sew him a tip if you win the Grand National and that, but it ain't going to be the same. You know, this would be a good thing for him to look at in years to come when he can realise that you were a jockey and that what you were lucky enough to achieve. Um, and I thought about it and then I thought about it you know what and and this friend of mine who taught me in this had no idea I was retiring you know he just said look it'd be a nice thing to have in years mm-hmm. to come and I thought about it and I thought you know what if I do this and it's my last year riding I'll get to a point where I won't be able to turn back it will come out of my mouth one day that I am retiring and I won't be able to change my mind and it kind of that was one of the reasons I did that but when did I decide five years earlier at the beginning of my last season, I won the champion hurdle on jet ski in Punchestown for Jesse Harrington. And I went back down to, to the McManuses that night and I was having dinner with JP and Noreen and I think John, their son, was there. And I said to JP during dinner, I said, look, JP, I've got something to tell you. I said, I think, and I haven't told anyone this, my wife and all, and I said, but I think this is going to be my last year riding. You know, if I'm lucky enough to win the Jolly Championship, it'll be my 20th year. And, you know, it's just the way I've thought about it for... I had this goal, my, this was my target. I didn't want to be a sports person that someone said he's not as good as he once was. And I I, I was that kind of person that I never cared about. Was, I was actually making sure that I wasn't saying to myself, you're not as good as you once were. Mm. You know, I didn't want that to happen. I, I used, you know, I used to use the excuse that I didn't want people to think he's not as good as he was, but I didn't want myself to ever think that I wasn't as good. I didn't want to get to a point halfway through a season and think you're gone. You know, you haven't got it anymore. Mm. So it was important for you to go out on a high. So it was important to go out. So I, I you know, I told him, and he said, "Look, you've got to think about these things." And 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 I, I at the beginning of that year, I rode my fastest fiftieth winner ever in a season. I rode my fastest hundredth winner in a season. I came home that night, and I said to my wife, and she heard it in the sports newsroom that I'd ridden my hundred winner, fastest hundred winner. And she goes, "Oh, it's amazing." You know, I said, "You know," she, I said, I "said you know what, Chanel?" I said, "I actually think I'm getting better." Said, Did you think, say that to her? Yeah, I said I think this is the first time in my life that I actually think I know what I'm, I actually think I've got it. I've got I know what I'm doing. And she looked at me and think, you psycho. <laughs> and and I and 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 she actually genuinely looked at me thinking you're a psycho. And and I, I but I I genuinely because statistically I felt like I had. Yeah. You know I'd spent twenty years. But you thought after nineteen years I've got I've been champion jockey. This now I've got it right. Yeah, now I've got it right. And then it, you know. And I had this thing in my head, I'd go and ride, you know, I'd, I'd never ridden 300 winners in a season. I'd ridden 307 winners in 2002 from January to January, you know, which was probably my greatest achievement. But I hadn't ridden 300 winners in a season and I thought this was going to be, I was going to ride my 300th winner and I was going to announce I was retiring after I'd done it. It would be a great way to retire. And I, I rode my fastest 150th winner and then I broke my collarbone and broke a few ribs and punctured my lung one evening in Worcester on a Thursday evening. And... I went back riding on the Monday, you know, four or five days after doing it, because I I felt like I couldn't have any days off. I felt like if I was going to ride 300 winners, it's only 65 days in the year you can't have a winner, and I couldn't afford to miss a day. And anyway, I, I did ride three winners and I came back five, four days, five days after, it, and then I got a fall the next day and my collarbone, my whole shot, as you'd expect, someone broken collarbone. No one knew that my body was in as bad a way as it was and, and to be honest I lost it mentally did you? yeah I lost it mentally it was the first time in my life that I went home and thought because I knew I was retiring at the end of the year I wasn't going to get what I was wanting I was on course to ride 200 winners I went riding like who in the right mind go riding four days after breaking your collarbone and puncturing your lung and, and you know I I, I, I I didn't even let my doctor didn't even know what happened to me you know I went I went on the quiet somewhere to get you quite often hide things that you had wrong. Oh, yeah, yeah. To yeah. Chanel. And this was the, this was the last race on Worcester, and I'm on a Thursday evening at eight o'clock. I wouldn't get into the ambulance. I wouldn't let them bring me to the hospital. I made, you know, the, I, I had a f- row with my GP, who was my doctor at the time. I told him, if I'm going, you're you're bringing me in your car. Mm. Uh, no one's going to see me going into the hospital. 
and went back riding you know five days later and, and and then when I got when I got the fall my collarbone was like a football I, I lost it mentally I, I, I it was like everything had ever it was like everything had been taken away yeah. it was like you know it was like so I, I just I could, it was the first, I'd say it was the only time in my life because I knew I wasn't getting another chance you know and I, I remember going on holidays for a week and coming back thinking that's finished yeah. you know I was still going to be champion jockey because yeah. I was I was you know that was in October you know that was in October and I was like 70 60 70 when I had everyone else I could nearly have I could nearly have not oh, ridden yeah, again, yeah. and um, but it was just mentally I was I was I was finished. Were injuries one of the hardest parts of it throughout? Were you've in, had a few naughty ones, haven't you? Yeah, like I broke my ankle, I broke my leg, broke my arm, my wrist, broke my back, um, broke my you know I fractured a few vertebrae a few times. You're saying these broke as if all my ribs, not particularly <laughs> yeah, big no, injuries. Broke all my it. ribs, fractured my sternum, punctured my lung, loads, collarbones, cheekbones, all my teeth, you know, so. But like it's part of the job, and if you're going to be a jump jockey, you have to. The lads that can't, you know, accept the, the dangers of it, you know, that's where they struggle a bit, and the, the, <coughs> they, they only last a period of time. The sooner you get it into your thick skull, with them, obviously the thicker you are, the better you are. But the thing is, as soon as you get it, the sooner you get that into your head that you're going to get injured, the better because the reality strikes home quicker, and you think, you know what, I'm supposed to get injured. I can't go around. You know, I said it to Ruby Walsh a few weeks ago. You know. Or a few months ago, when he got injured, he broke his leg in November, and he was, you know, he was, he was in bad off form. You know, he was getting a little older, and he, you know, he, you know, he was worried about it. I said, like, why are you worried about it? I said, like, you know as well as I do. I said, you haven't had a break for a year and a half or two yeah. years. So you're riding Comes that many territory. I said, like, just because you're a little bit older doesn't mean you're going to get cause. And he yeah. kind of thought about it. You know what? You know what? You're right. I said, it's no different. How does that affect? Because you've you've been touching golf for a, a couple of Cheltenham mm. festivals. Mm. You've mentioned Ruby in November mm. broke his leg. How does that affect your build up to the festival? Is it as is it as important? So, for instance, if, if I hadn't been playing for three months and then go and play a game, you'd be nowhere near it. How does it affect you as a job? Yeah, it's not a, not a, not as much. You know, not as much. You know, the fitness levels obviously you need to be pretty fit, but. And there's no, it's like playing a football match. I say there's nothing like playing a football to match to, be, to replicate it. You know, I know that he's been in Santry for for the last sort of two months. You know, working maybe even longer since he broke his leg. He's been in Santry every day. You know, you know he's a very dedicated lad. Look, he'll go back to Cheltenham. He's he's one of those lads. That, you know, obviously he's to be as good as he has. He's worked very hard hard at it, but he has worked and he's the hardest worker of all. But he's very natural. Mm. You know, he's he's lucky. Like he's like a he's like a messy. You know, I mean, it's like. It just comes easy yeah. to when I don't think he's back in the saddle you know, today. He could probably have, he could probably have got back a week or ten days ago, and 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 I I chatted to him about it and I said, look, what's the point? You know, you give yourself as long as you can, yeah. and it, God forbid if you got another injury, you know, he's riding, you know, in Thurles, um today. You think if God if you got an injury, will he give it all the time he could? He done it the right way. If it doesn't work out, well, it wasn't from taking the chances you shouldn't have taken, but. Look, he's you know he's ridden more winners at Cheltenham Festival than anyone else. He's the best jockey that I have seen. So, are you I'd looking forward? Him, I'd rather have him on my horse than have him riding against me. Mm. Are you looking forward to Cheltenham next week, or do you dread it a little bit now? Do you or? know what? I don't look forward. To, uh, look, I love horse racing. I love sport. I love elite sport. You know, but I don't. I don't go to Cheltenham the way I used to. I don't think about it. I don't get obsessed with it. I don't get engrossed in it as much as I as do I. You get any buzz about being back there? Not really. No, do you not? No, I, I love the I love the enjoyment of it, yeah. and I love watching good horses and good jockeys win. But I'm not past the stage yet where I think I couldn't do it. Yeah, which is not that must be hard. Which is not helping me. I don't look and I think, yeah, sure, the likes of Ruby and them lads are brilliant. But I don't look at it and think, do you know what? It was a good job you retired because you 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 definitely couldn't compete anymore. Yeah, and I'm just I'm just not there yet. Look, I love I love watching the champion hurling, the Gold Cup, and all those big races, and I will. But I don't go into it with the same intensity, the same obsession that I had before. Mm. I don't walk in there a couple of hours before racing, go into the way and put my racing post down. And the only time I'd be seen during Shetland was when I come out to ride in six races every day and I wouldn't look left or right of what I was doing and I'd go back in again. Now I'm out doing different things for different, you know, I'm an ambassador for William Hill and Albert Bartlett, Johnny Bartlett used to sponsor me, I do stuff for him and obviously working for ITV so a lot of things I'm seeing a lot of things in Cheltenham that I never saw never before seen, yeah. it was like when I went to work uh, as a pundit the first day in ITV uh, or the first day you know when I went to work as a pundit I went to Cheltenham I didn't know where the toilet was because <laughs> I'm not allowed in the way room you know I mean? I'm thinking like 
you know, I've been going, I've been coming here since 1995. Yes. 1994 was the first time in Jotham. October 94 was the first time in Jotham. I didn't know where the toilet was outside. <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden you're, you're, you're in the toilet beside just, I don't mean, I'm not meaning this in an arrogant way, but regular punters yeah, are asking about racing yeah. them thinking, oh God, I was never like this before. I was having to talk to people about what I was doing. Dose of reality. You know, dose of reality, you know. Where do you get a cup of tea? Yeah. What so, horse are you most looking forward to seeing next week? Um, look, I'd like to see, I think, Bouvedere will hopefully win the champion order for, for JP and Noreen. You know, that would be, you know, they're great supporters of the game. I'd, I'd love to see him when he'd be, the Gold Cup is such a, an open race. I think Altior will win the champion chase. And that, look, the rest of them are, are pretty open races. But if I was picking one horse out, you know, I'd, 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 I'd pick, I'd like to see um, Bouvedere win the champion order. I'd like to see, there's a lad, Nick Gifford, trains a horse of JP's called Did They Leave You Out To? I'd like to see him win too because I, I know that you know look JP is a you know JP and Noreen are great supporters of the game and great supporters of you know they have horses with the Willie Mullins and the Garden I'd say for but they have horses with a lot of other smaller trainers mm. and they have horses with Nick Gifford and England and I think I think JP personally and would get as much satisfaction, satisfaction of, of that horse winning mm. as he would any of the others I'm not saying he will win because the bumpers are very open race mm. win, but I reckon if he won other than winning the champion hurdle, get as much satisfaction, you know, because he, you know, that's the sort of man he is. So, I'd, I'd like to see did they leave you out too in the bumper? Mm. I want to move on to a bit of football chat. I know you're a massive Arsenal fan. It's torture. No, I'm not a, an Arsenal fan. <coughs> Excuse me. It's torture. And they do my head in. Mm. So, I, as driven as you are, and knowing you the way I do, and how stubborn you are, certainly yeah. one thing you've got in common with Arsene Wenger. Mm. I, I became I you know I became an Arsenal fan. I was five when Arsenal won the nineteen seventy nine FA Cup. I had a lot of friends who were oh, sorry. I had, I had two cousins who were Man United fans who were older than me. So you went the other way. Yes, and my dad then had told me about the Arsenal team that had Pat Jennings and Liam Brady and Frank Stableton and then you know there was a there was a good crew of Irish people in that team. Um, and I went the other way because Arsenal won. You know, um, and I became an Arsenal fan then because of. Pat Jennings and Liam Brady and that and I look through the periods of times of the team look in the last at the beginning of Arsenal Wenger's reign Arsenal were very lucky that you know we had a, a back four that was probably the best back four probably yeah. in, in English football um, and that developed and then you get to the point where the in, the Invincibles in 2003 2004 you know they were a big physical well organised team you know that had had Obviously, Tony Adams had just retired, but there was a lot of there was a lot of that structure still, still there. You know, nice. we had Saul Campbell, you know, Martin Keown, yeah. Ashley Cole, yeah. Lauren, um, Seaman still behind that. You know, and then you had you know our our midfield, whether it was Gilberto or Edu, but it was you know um, Vieira, obviously Perez, Burkamp, Henri, Lundberg. You know, with the exception of Lundberg, all those, and uh, the exception of Lundberg and Ashley Cole, they were all big lumps. Yeah. You know, I remember Danny Murphy telling me that the first time he went to Highbury, you know, he looked back and he said to Steve Jarvis, look at the size of these lads, yeah. you know? Um, and that wind that on five, six years. Yeah. You know, they're like a, they were like he a, went Barcelona types, didn't he, in terms of his recruitment. Yeah. I, th I find it quite sad when I see him on the touchline now, I see him getting grilled in press conferences yeah. because I'm with you in terms of he transformed English Arsenal. Football. Yes, English football. He was, he was on a pedestal for yeah. coaches, managers, aspiring to play the way Arsenal were yeah. playing but he, for me he didn't evolve he didn't evolve in the way Sir Alex evolved yeah. getting coaches in trusting them trusting people to do jobs underneath him and him just and, managing and let them make the decisions yeah, yeah I, I, I agree and and look it, it's happened you know look people would say look he's won three of the last five FA Cups or whatever it is you think mm -hmm. that's that's relatively you know if you were if you were Liverpool um, or Tottenham, you'd say, God, that's great success, yeah. isn't it? But there, but Arsenal is not Liverpool or Tottenham. You know, Arsenal should be competing with Manchester United, and obviously Liverpool haven't won a Premier League title for for quite a long time. Um, but do I look at do I look at them and I think you know at the moment, I, I think the great thing about football is I remember George Graham when he took over Arsenal and they asked him what is he thinking. He goes, I'll tell you what I'm thinking. I'm thinking I'm taking over a bunch of so and sos that got the last fella sacked. You know what I mean? And that's what's going to happen. And whatever happens when Arsenal that time does, when Arsenal and Wenger does go, I hope the next man comes in and, and thins them out pretty quick. Mm. You know, because I'm not sure that a lot of them, there's some of them, look, it's easy for us to sit here and slag footballers there, but I don't know that 
some of them are just quite good enough to be playing for Arsenal mm. and some of them have made little and, and he's the one that carries the can you know you look at the mistake that you know professionalism is about an elimination of mistakes that's what it is and if you look at the mistakes you know that Mustafi made against I'd be disappointed I'm, not, I'm a terrible footballer but I'd be disappointed if I let you know a, li- a little like nudging a little lad that's 5 foot 5 nudge yeah. me off the ball you know uh, can you imagine Martin Keown or Tony Adams or wouldn't you know, happen would it wouldn't happen he'd be you know he'd know he was behind him for a yeah. start you know so those, those they keep happening though so there's a reason why they keep happening yeah. and the personnel that you recruit so it's a it is a bit of a vicious circle and as Martin Pipe said to me once and whoever it was said it before him you know the definition of stupidity is someone that does the same thing over and over again, time again. and expects a different result yeah. you know so things have to change you know the you know, and I and I love Arsene Wenger and all, but you know, there comes a time when you think, you know what? And, and I think he deserves, you know, he deserves to enjoy his last period of time as a football manager. And the way it's going at the moment, at as an Arsenal football manager, the way it's going at the moment, that's not happening. Mm. You know, so if they said, by the way, can he go upstairs? Do you think? I, I don't see why not. You know, but I think if they decide now, they said, by the way, they come out in six weeks' time and say. Arsene Wenger is going to be stepping down at the end of the season and let the fans give him give him the respect that he deserves but the way it's going at the moment they're losing respect mm. you know and they're losing respect because they're not winning and whether the sad reality of it is that is what sport is all about and the book stops you know it's like if you're sailing the ship there's only one fella that's going to sink it and, and he's carrying the can mm. so I just want to tell a little story about when you came in you very kindly came into MK Dons when I was coaching there we were trying to get promotion at the time from mm-hmm. from League One, and I've always said that there's very talented footballers at League One at Championship level. Talent-wise, some of them are the same as yeah. Premier League players, but the difference is what goes on between the head. And there was a player who I'll remain nameless yeah. was working with at the time, and I was trying to curl him, trying to coach him, trying to nurture him because I'd been through it, I'd gone off the boil in my playing career, so I was trying to impart that knowledge that I had onto yeah. him and spent so much time trying to get him through that stage you couldn't believe it you couldn't believe that somebody with a talent which he was very very talented wasn't willing to apply himself you found that very very hard to believe didn't you well you know that's probably how long ago six years ago is it mm. however long ago three, three, three years ago. only three years yeah. ago three years ago but uh, you know that same person like uh, I didn't know where he is now mm. You know, and I'm looking at I'm I'm looking at him thinking, does he realise the regrets he's going to have? But then you said he might not even realise that yet. No, I don't think you so. You know, and that's that's the unfortunate part. But he was in a very privileged position where he could have made something. I most certainly wasn't the most talented jockey. You know, I never for one minute. The only time that I ever thought I was the best jockey, and I don't mind saying it now, when I'm retired, was when I was on a horse. I actually genuinely felt I convinced myself whether I was or I wasn't. I genuinely convinced myself I was the best when I was on a horse. Now, when I got off it, I was so insecure. I was so, I lived in fear. I, I looked and thought, God, I could be so much better. I'm not as good as, you know. So I never had doubts when I was on a horse. And I, and I feel like if I went on a football field, I'd never have doubts. When I got off it. But even after five, ten, ten uh, jobs, I, you would still feel like that? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. I, I'd feel that, you know what? Someone's going to beat me. And then I'd, then I'd ride more winners. Like, I, I, I broke Sir Gordon Richard's record in 2002. I'd been champion jockey seven or eight times whatever it was six or seven times and I kind of felt that do you know what if I can ride this many winners someone else can you know what I mean so I was always like well, if I can do it and that's when I just to go back what I said when I rode my fastest 100 winner in my last year riding I didn't know where I got enjoyment from it or whether it annoyed me the fact that I was 40 and that I'd actually done something that I couldn't do for 20 years yeah. and I'm thinking I'm a 40 year old and I can do it some little Pop is definitely going to, and that 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 really worried on you, that never. really worried me. But you go back to the the lad that you said that you were coaching. He must. He, there will come a period in his life or a time in his life where he will have regrets. You know, I I certainly didn't think I was the most talented. I genuinely thought I was the best worker. Now, another lads would think there's good work as well, but I definitely work my best. I tell you, what I I use quite often to. So I've coached uh, the Irish on the race teams the last couple of years, and. They obviously see Ronaldo, Messi, mm. you know, that usual debate, who's the better player, blah, blah, blah. I say to them, what do you think of Wayne Rooney? Mm. He's crap. I said, okay, go back 15 years, 12, 15, whatever years ago. Rooney, 
and Ronaldo were yeah. fairly similar in yeah. terms of where their stature at Man United at the yeah. time. One player devoted his life yeah. to being a footballer and being the absolute best he can be. Yeah. And he's ended up smashing all kinds of records. Wayne really still had a very, very good career. Yeah. But I think he will have regrets. Yeah, possibly. You know, Rooney was a very naturally talented lad. <clears throat> and I still look at him now and I and I you know, I, I think Rooney was a brilliant footballer because I watched him play and, and you watch him even now he can play balls into areas without even looking because mm. he knows that's Gifted. where it, that he's got a lot of natural talent. You look at the physique of Ronaldo and you think, yeah, maybe he might be a bit vain and whatever, but you don't get in that position looking like that without being a, you know, being a professional mm. in every way. You know, his diet, his diet, his fitness, his regime is obviously dedicated to being the best footballer in the world, and that's not a coincidence. You know, and you look at how many footballers, and yeah, sure, whatever it may be, a little vain or whatever it is, and you know, he may love himself, but how many footballers would pull their shirt off and think, you know, and whether you like it or not, sport is all about, like life is all about opinions. Everyone's got them. Mm. Everyone's got them. But statistics don't lie. You know, and statistics will tell you that, you know, that Ronaldo and Messi, you know, are have broke all the stats and, and it's, they're out of time. Who's your favourite? I'll tell you who I think my favourite footballer of all time was. I'd, I'd love to say George Best. I met him a few times and he was a, he was a little bit of a legend or Liam Brady. I honestly think that what Diego Maradona did to win a World Cup with Argentina, pretty much on his own, pass, is it? was, and it's not because Messi hasn't won the World Cup, but what he did at Napoli to win mm. Serie A, when Serie A was probably the best league in the world, it was probably a better league than than the Liga is yeah. now, or the Premier League, mm. you know, he won at Serie A with Napoli when they'd never won, they never looked like winning a game of football beforehand, they're a little bit better recently, but they haven't won a Serie A since he won Serie A on his own mm. as a footballer and I don't care what anyone says that you know not just because he did it on an international stage but he did it domestically as well did it domestic, domestically club. and look people would you know he, you, you, you speak about Ronaldo Diego Maradona was looked at everything that a professional footballer you know Shoot. he, he shouldn't <laughs> but in terms of a, in, in terms of an achievement you know, I think, and you can talk about Pelly, who played in the great teams, or George Besser, but he genuinely, I think, won two. He won two championships. He won a world champ. He won a world cup, and a team that it, that mm -hmm. he carried, and he won a domestic title with a team that was in the best league in the world at the time on his own, mm -hmm. and he proved it because they've never won before or since. You know, you look at the Manchester United, or the Real Madrid, or the Barcelona. That they've all gifted individuals are gift, you know they put, as uh, teams. Yeah. So. So who's, my, who's my favourite Ronaldo or Messi hmm. you evaded that one quite nicely actually. I did who's my favourite um, who would you I uh, wouldn't have a clue it's not it's not split it's not fair you know yeah. Messi can do things with a ball that you know you see him dribbling around it. Like, like Ronaldo scores great headers and he you know and, and so, but Messi can dribble from one end of the football the pitch to the other and still score mm. if you if you got a selection of their 10 best goals Messi's best 10 goals would be better than Ronaldo's mm. best 10 goals no. I'm taking Messi then is the answer yeah I think so I think just Messi <laughs> listen I don't want to take up any more time I know you're a busy man I really really appreciate you coming in I know everything about football and horse racing now don't they <laughs> <laughs> people are going to listen to me and thinking God well, what an opinion you think so and so he is it's been an absolute but, pleasure really really appreciate you coming cheers. in and I hope Thanks. you do enjoy some parts of next week at Cheltenham oh ah, yeah I will I'll enjoy it more than people think hey Pete thanks very much cheers thanks Hey, hope you enjoyed that latest offering from Off The Ball. If you want to subscribe, and you should, check out just up here. All our latest stuff is just down here. Generally, knock yourself out.